Uh, hi class, um, so here's uh, part two of the lecture. So in this part, we're gonna be looking mainly at some of the things that occur in the later stages um, of the secretory pathway. Um, one of the big things is the formation of these things called multivesicular bodies. Um, <clears throat> and these actually carry uh, sort of um, membranes to the lysosome that need to be degraded. And oftentimes they're carrying also receptors. Um, and they form by invagination of the endosome. So for example, in the case with the FGF receptor, if you need to get rid of it, or the EGF receptor, the epidermal growth factor receptor, um, it gets packaged into sort of one of these multivesicular bodies, and then it'll go on to fuse with the lysosome, at which point these little ve vesicles in the multivesicular um, bodies end up getting degraded. Uh, something that's kind of interesting with these is that um, occasionally these um, multivesicular bodies can actually fuse with the plasma membrane, um, and these uh, release exosomes. Um, and these exosomes are actually quite uh, actively studied um, right now because they seem to be a, a sort of a common occurrence um, that happens in specific cancer cells, okay? Um, so, um, so here's basically plasma membrane to lysosome transport. You have clathrin-coated vesicles, oftentimes uh, sort of uh, getting butted off the plasma membrane. They'll go on to fuse with the early endosome. Um, and then uh, you can have a recycling event where you're bringing receptors back. Uh, vesicles are also coming off of the trans-Golgi. But then you start to get the invagination of certain things, um, certain membranes to create these multivesicular bodies. Um, and then they'll go on sort of to become the late endosome, at which point the lysosome can fuse with it. The um, vacuolar ATPase will start pumping protons in, and that will get all the acid hydrolases and the acid lipases and things like that to sort of remove all the proteins and lipids that are associated with these vesicles, and then you're just sort of left with a, with a lysosome. Um, <clears throat> Now, the formation of the multivesicular bodies actually uh, requires uh, ubiquitin. Okay, so here you have your early endosome and with a receptor, and the receptor is actually going to get packaged into a multivesicular um, body, and so the, the receptor will get ubiquitinated, and that is a signal for it to basically get packaged into this uh, sort of invaginated vesicle, um, and then you have your multivesicular body and that will fuse with the lysosome and eventually the lipases and the proteases um, and other things, all the other acid hydrolases will go in and cleave everything up. Um, now the ubiquitin is actually um, recognized by this protein called escort and we'll see how the escort proteins work in a second to generate these invaginated vesicles. Um, and here it is right here. Here is your sort of receptor with your cargo. It's got ubiquitin on it. Um, you have uh, uh, PI3P, and that's recognized by um, escort 0. It then gets passed off to escort 1 and escort 2, and then eventually um, it gets sort of put into one of these uh, sort of inverted um, vesicles here. Okay, um, and there's a, a AAA ATPase um, that helps sort of throw everything in um, and sort of push it all in here. Um, for the undergrads, I don't really expect you guys to memorize this exact pathway. Um, for some of the graduate students, I think it's probably useful for you guys to know it, um, just because there are a number of labs that are sort of studying exosomes right now and, and understanding how they're formed and the topology um, of these sort of uh, receptors and stuff when they go to fuse um, with the plasma membrane is kind of important. Um, so I would, I would actually uh, think about that um, because it's a, it's a cool sort of topic. Um, okay, now it's not only these multivesicular bodies, but it's actually important um, in viral release. Okay, so um, in a viral release, what you'll have is everything in the virus getting packaged into this vesicle, um, and then this would 
sort of be the virus right here with the um, and then when this multivesicular body actually fuses with the plasma membrane, um, the virus particle can, can be uh, released. Um, also, you can get it sort of pinching off um, here and get the virus particle. So it's, it's very similar. Um, so this would actually be uh, um, sort of the exosome when it fuses would get released, but in the case with the virus, um, it's uh, sort of just pinches off the plasma membrane. I hope I didn't confuse everybody there. I, I sort of said this was the virus and it's not. It's actually um, coming off of the plasma membrane. This is just a multivesicular body. But the point is that they form sort of the same way. Okay, and so it, pretty much all viruses are going to do that as they um, sort of pinch off and butt off the, the plasmid. So um, I have Ebola, HIV, um, but also it wouldn't surprise me at all if um, if coronavirus uh, does the same thing. So if you're a scientist at the CDC and you want to try to find something that's going to prevent uh, the spread of a viral infection, uh, the escort proteins might actually be something interesting to target, right? Um, so, um, okay, you can also have this thing called uh, transcytosis. And I sort of mentioned this in the first part of today's lecture, um, where you have an antibody um, and an FC receptor, and the FC receptor will take up antibodies and uh, basically bring them across sort of um, uh, an epithelial uh, bilayer, right? So if you have a whole bunch of um, cells in epithelial and it's sort of forming a barrier where things can't freely pass, but you need to get antibodies across, what will end up happening is you have your FC receptor that binds to the FC region of the antibody. That's FC is short for fragment constant. Um, and so that'll get packaged into um, a clathrin coated vesicle, which will fuse to the early endosome. And then there's some sorting. You get recycling back to the plasma membrane. Um, and you'll eventually get to a recycling endosome via a transport vesicle and then a transcytosis transport vesicle, and that will release um, the antibody. So it turns out that this is a really important process in newborn mammals, okay, that are nursing, um, and they'll get antibodies from their mother's milk, um, and uh, that provides a level of immunity um, for uh, an infant. Um, and the major sorting occurs actually at, in sort of the recycling endosome. You can see the recycling vesicle going here and everything else going um, to the other side. So you'll have antibodies in the intestinal lumen and then it, it can get past the um, intestinal epithelium uh, via this transcytosis pathway. Um, you can also get protein recycling um, by the endosome. So here's your insulin receptor and you know you have your glucose transporter and then all of a sudden if insulin binds you get a signaling event um, and more glucose transporter is actually brought to the plasma membrane. Okay and then that can uptake more and more um, uh, glucose. And so it's pretty simple to understand why this is um, very important in diabetes. Um, now in the case with a polarized epithelial cell, um, things can get a little bit more complicated because there's actually two domains. There's the apical surface and then you have these tight junctions which we'll cover when we cover um, cellular junctions. Um, and then you have the basal lateral. Um, and oftentimes the proteins that are here are quite different from the proteins here. So this requires um, quite a bit of sorting um, from the post-Golgi. Um, but also in the case with endocytosis, um, you need to get things to the right location. So you'll uh, endocytose from one and then it'll go on and sort of fuse with the, with the late endosome and then also things are sort of coming here. So you can sort of see the, the late endosome is sort of the intersection um, of both of these during endocytosis and eventually they'll go off to the lysosome. Um, and so these things can be very distinct, the early ones, um, but as you get to the later endosomes, they, they become um, sort of heterogeneous in nature that, where they contain both the proteins from the apical surface and from the basal lateral surface.
Okay, so now we're just going to go um, and look at exocytosis. This is basically going from the Golgi to the cell exterior, and it can go in two sort of main pathways. Okay, you can just be sort of a default pathway where you're going right from the Golgi to the cell exterior, or you can generate these secretory vesicles um, that have secreted proteins in them and they can get concentrated. The best way to think of these secretory vesicles is to think of vesicles containing neurotransmitter in nerve cells. Um, so here it is sort of in the big picture. Um, you can sort of have a constitutive uh, secretory pathway where just proteins, they butt off from the, the trans-Golgi network. They're in a vesicle and then they'll fuse um, with the plasma membrane releasing their cargo um, or their plasma membrane receptors. Now in the case with secretory vesicles, they also butt off the trans-Golgi network, but there's an enrichment step where you just have concentrated uh, secretory cargo. Um, and then they'll sort of sit, and a lot of times they can just sit um, and be docked at the plasma membrane, but they don't fuse until they get some sort of signal like a hormone or a neurotransmitter that will call the, cause the vesicles to fuse to the plasma membrane. Um, so ultimately what you have in sort of the whole sorting process is a lot of the proteins are made, most all proteins are made, most all secreted proteins are made um, and translocated into the endoplasmic reticulum. They'll butt off in a COP2 vesicle and then they form um, the, uh, the ergic and the vesicular tubular clusters um, and they'll go on uh, to sort of become the, the Golgi and then they'll go through the cis medial trans Golgi where all the glycosylation is occurring. Um, and then they'll get to the trans Golgi network where there is um, some sorting. Okay, so if you have the mannose 6-phosphate receptor, which we talked about in part one of today's lecture, uh, that'll actually signal it and divert it off to the lysosome. You also will have sort of constitutive secretion where um, large vesicles just sort of pinch off the trans-Golgi network and then fuse with the plasma membrane. But then you can also have the secretory vesicles, which will require some sort of signal to mediate their fusion and release from the cell. Um, and here's how the secretory vesicles are made. You have um, secreted uh, cargo going through uh, the trans-Golgi and then it gets to the trans-Golgi network and then they can be pinched off by clathrin coated vesicles and then the vesicles actually get concentrated um, by recycling event where the clathrin will pick up and um, and sort of recycle sort of some of the membrane leaving the cargo um, behind until you have a concentrated mature secretory vesicle. And then this can sort of sit at the plasma membrane in sort of a docked but unfused state. And then once it gets the signal, it can fuse. Um, here are some of the secretory vesicles. Uh, this happens to be an image of a, a pancreatic beta cell that's secreting insulin. Um, and so here you can see the mature secretory vesicles. And you can sort of see here that it's actually getting um, concentrated uh, as, as it goes. Um, Um, okay, so once again, for exocytosis, it's very simple. It's just like what we saw with, with regular membrane fusion. You have your secretory vesicle, and it can sit here in a dock state, and then once it gets the signal, it will fuse um, and release its concentration. So once again, um, review how fusion occurs in all the proteins, the V-snares and the T-snares, um, and how you reset it um, and all that stuff with NSF and, and, and whatnot, okay? Um, um, here's actually just an image of um, insulin, a secretory vesicle with a whole bunch of insulin. This one is actually docked at the plasma membrane and this one has just recently fused. Um, so pretty great images here if you ask me. Um, um, Okay, another thing that happens in the secretory pathway, which I really haven't spent much time on, but is very, very important, is the protein processing. Okay, so occasionally um, a protein will get processed uh, 
as it goes through the secretory pathway. We've already seen how glycosylation can occur, but occasionally a protein um, can encode multiple proteins and it can get cleaved in the secretory pathway. Um, and one of the sort of classic ones is pro opio uh, which is shown right here. Uh, it's encoded by the POMC gene. Um, and so this will actually get processed to produce different hormones, okay? Uh, beta endorphin um, is one, beta MSH, um, gamma lipotrophin, and alpha MSH all sort of come from the, the POMC gene here. Um, and so as it travels through the secretory pathway, it's got the sort of signal peptide, it'll get brought in, the signal peptide gets cleaved, um, and then the various protein will get cleaved. And we sort of saw this happening with insulin, how it uh, got cleaved when we were talking about translocation and protein folding um, of insulin. And these can oftentimes also acquire disulfide bonds before they're um, chopped up. Another protein that it happens to is actually the, the yeast mating type pheromone, it undergoes a very similar sort of processing um, as it's traveling through um, the secretory pathway. Um, okay, so once again, uh, exocytosis can oftentimes be a regulated process. So this happens to be a mast cell. Mast cells um, <clears throat> secrete uh, um, histamine. Uh, or, and so what ends up happening is you have the, the, the mast cell with all of the, these um, sort of secretory vesicles, some of which are fused, and then when the mast cell gets the right signal, um, it releases uh, the histamine um, into the cell, okay, or outside the cell. Um, so whenever you guys sneeze, um, this is basically what happens. You go from this cell to what looks like this and you're releasing um, all of the, the histamine and you kind of sneeze and this is what happens um, sort of within uh, with allergies. Um, now the exocytosis can be sort of um, um, uh, sort of regulated in where it's released and it can be directional. So here, once again, you have another mast cell, um, and here you have a bead that, that's basically um, catalyzing the release of the histamine, and it's only on this side. Um, it's not down on this side. Okay, so you can see here that not everything is sort of fusing with the plasma membrane as you're sort of seeing um, in this slide. Okay, there's, uh, it, it can be regulated and it can occur just on part of the cell. Um, okay, and one other thing too is oftentimes you just are fusing vesicles with the plasma membrane just to grow the plasma membrane. It doesn't always have to release um, components. There's there's occasion where you just where you just need to grow the plasma membrane, right? So, for example, after mitosis and during cytokinesis, um, you you sort of need to actually grow the plasma membrane to get the two cells. So you have vesicles that are just fusing for the sole purpose of growing the um, membrane so you can sort of create this cleavage furrow. Um, same thing happens in phagocytosis where vesicles are just fusing with the plasma membrane to help grow the plasma membrane so you can engulf um, a bacterium. Um, and also in wound healing, occasionally if a plasma membrane is cut, you will free, you will basically fuse a whole bunch of vesicles to the plasma membrane to help grow it, um, to sort of seal up that wound um, in wound repair. Um, okay, so now on to polarized cells. Um, so polarized cells have a unique um, sorting problem because they have different domains on the plasma membrane, right? We've already seen this with epithelial cells where you have an apical surface and a basal lateral surface and they're separated by this um, sort of tight junction that's here. But also in nerve cells, you'll have um, the axon and the nerve uh, termini um, as well as then the cell body and the dendrites. And so certain um, neurotransmitter receptors will need to be guided to the dendrites, whereas you don't want those same things in the nerve termini. You want basically vesicles that have neurotransmitter um, and not the neurotransmitter receptors. 
Okay, so once again, this is a sort of a complex sorting problem that occurs in these uh, sort of polarized cells. Um, and here's how it can work. There's uh, two basic mechanisms. You can have direct sorting where just vesicles destined to the apical surface are um, butting off from the trans-Golgi network and fusing with the apical surface. Um, and likewise, proteins destined for the basal lateral surface will butt off the trans-Golgi network and then fuse with the basal lateral surface. Um, but you can also have both of them go and fuse with like the basal lateral surface and then just proteins that are destined to the apical surface will then get selected and packaged and go into a basal lateral early endosome um, and then things will butt off and then fuse with the apical surface. So two mechanisms here of how you can sort from the trans-Golgi network um, into a polarized epithelial cells. Um, and in the case with um, vesicles, synaptic vesicles, it's a little bit different. Okay, because a lot of the synaptic um, neurotransmitters actually get loaded into a secretory pathway sort of at the end, not in the endoplasmic reticulum, right? This is one of the sort of exceptions to the rule. So what will happen is you have your um, synaptic carrier vesicle with um, your sort of synaptic vesicle membrane protein that will butt off the trans-Golgi network. It will eventually travel down the axon, fuse with the plasma membrane, um, and then there's endocytosis. It'll get sorted into the early endosome, and then you have um, your secretory vesicle, which can then get loaded with neurotransmitter, um, and then that can just sort of sit there and wait till it gets the signal with which to fuse. Oftentimes, depolarization or a calcium flux or something will um, will cause it to fuse. And one of the things with nerve cells, it's not an all or none process. Often it's very regulated. So the nerve cells actually tightly control the amount of neurotransmitter that's actually released um, from it. Okay. Um, so here's just a, a molecular model of a synaptic vesicle. You can see here you have your vacuolar ATPase that's pumping in protons and the protons that are building up here then actually drive um, an antiporter so that it's taking up uh, glutamate. So this is your um, proton driven glutamate transporter um, and then also here shown is uh, the, the vesicle snare. Um, a, Edition 6 of your book has really um, expanded on this. This is from Edition 5. Um, I like this one better because, uh, to me, it, it shows a little bit more um, detail because it's blown up. But the image in your book, it, it, it's a little too busy for me. Um, but you guys should all sort of check it out. Um, and part of the thing is that in this image, only about 70% uh, of the estimated 50 proteins are shown. And in the other one, they actually show more as well as uh, showing sort of the plasma membrane and stuff like that. Um, okay, so I think that's all I had for today. Um, next week we're going to cover ion channels, so read chapter 11 um, uh, in the fifth edition or these pages with uh, chapter 11 in the sixth edition. Um, and once again, if you guys have any questions or um, of me, you know, just shoot me an email.